familiar faces and uh, love seeing you guys. I know you're muted on your end, but I'll just assume you said hi back. So there he is. Hey, Brad. Hey, man. How are you? Good. Good. Doing relatively speaking, but yeah. yeah relatively speaking. Yeah, we're going to dive into that. Um, we're going to give people a minute more. I think we've got about 70 or so people that are going to be on the call today. So um, I didn't I didn't realize, Drew, when we scheduled this, that our denomination had, there was like a denominational one this morning that they did that like just went, just ended a little bit ago with our new president. And then um, there were some other ones that districts had going. So people might be a little zoomed out right now. We'll see, but, uh, but definitely going to have a good crew here with us joining us right now. So it's going to be really good. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Yeah. You got your Yankees ball cap on too and everything. And I know, man, just trying to represent, <clears throat> represent well. Are you yeah. at home there or is that an office or? This is in the office. Yeah. My office, I'm able to get to my office without any real human contact. So, uh, so it's kind of a nice place to get away and, our house, as you're discovering, and maybe we might end up with a visit, but uh, as you know, it's hard to have these Zoom calls at home with kids around, right? Oh my goodness, yeah. We're, I'm, I've got my laptop on my bed right now, so yeah. this is our yeah. tiny little bedroom here, so yeah. yeah. Well, um, I'm going to go ahead. We're going to get started. Lauren, can you give me the, are we good to go? All right, awesome. Well, uh, it is, you guys, it really is such a privilege, uh, you know, to have Drew with us today. Um, Drew, there's just people kind of chiming in from all over the place, uh, lots of different ministry contexts and different leadership contexts that are going to be joining us, um, lots of different years of experience in ministry and leadership, and so um, it's going to be a it's going to be a good crew. But you guys, it's such a privilege to have Drew with us. Um, Drew and I go back several years. We actually had really our, our first meeting was actually at your apartment, and uh, it was really a, a great moment. Probably seven probably seven years ago now when we first met. Now that I think back about this, but yeah. Um, but Drew has been, his story and our, my, our stories intersected um, through planting in New York City and church planting in New York City. And Drew has been um, really, a, I, I, I use the term prolific church planter in New York, um, planted a lot of churches, um, but he's also just grown to be a really good friend, a really healthy, uh, a really healthy leader that I respect so much. And um, maybe on the West Coast, uh, a lot of us on the West Coast maybe don't know Drew as well as a lot of people on the East Coast, but uh, but Drew's a, a pretty well-known leader on the East Coast and, and a well-respected voice. But um, Drew, would you mind just like tell us a little bit about your family real quick and kind of introduce kind of your guys' world to us for just a moment? Yeah, so thanks for having me, Brad. You've been a friend, mentor, uh, just just a great yeah, person to know over the last few years. And so, um, yeah, thanks so much for this invitation. I, yeah, so my family, my wife and I, Tina, we actually met here in New York in 2004. Uh, we got married in 2008 and uh, we've lived here in the city and we have two kids, my son, David, who's eight and my daughter, Avery, who's four. We live on this little island called Rosal Island, which is right in between Queens and Manhattan. And uh, currently I'm pastoring a church that we planted called Hope Midtown, which is part of the larger family of churches that we planted um, in 2012 called Hope Church NYC, which is after we planted that first church. I think it was a little bit after that, that you and I had met. So, yeah. 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 yeah I think that, I, in fact, I think you guys had maybe just launched Roosevelt, the Roosevelt Island congregation. You had just launched that one out of the Queens congregation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right when we met was, was during that time period. And, and guys, we're going to talk a little bit about the family of churches. We're going to ask you some questions. By the way, just so everyone knows, if you weren't on the call last week, um, just so you know how this works, is I've got some questions that I'm going to ask Drew. And then um, as you're coming up with questions, use the chat box. And then Lauren's going to be filtering some of those. Uh, she'll be sort of coalescing those and then sending them to me so that um, we can answer those a little bit more specifically. But um, for those of you that were on last week, I hope you noticed that I took some of the advice from last week. I have a little better setting behind me. Uh, <laughs> Drew, last week we, we were with a, a couple that's planted a virtual church. Actually, they had vision for this long before this crisis. And so we had them on, they offered tips to us. And so today I've got a little light in front of me. I've got a back <laughs> a little better and trying to look better than just a Taliban capture video. So, um, so, the first question, I think this is probably the biggest one um, that a, a lot of us, I mean, those, especially all of us on the West Coast, is really related to um, what you guys are experiencing. I mean, I think we kind of see on the news what's happening, but you're on the ground in New York. Um, 
Tell us a little bit about, before we get into the other stuff, just how are you guys doing? What's the lay of the land? How can we be praying? Give us a little scope of what's going on in New York these days. Yeah, thanks so much for asking. Um, I mean, frankly, it's been devastating. I think, uh, and I don't, I don't know how else to put it. It's been, um, you know, a friend of mine who we met shortly after 9-11 and he had grown up here in the city. He planted a church, Mike Keller, his dad is Tim. And Mike was, we were just both kind of reminiscing about 9-11 and how different this is. And it feels so different because back after 9-11, we could, it was a single moment where we could all rally together and grieve together. And I think right now it's been an ongoing uh, battle and suffering that people are undergoing here in the city. And so it's been really challenging and difficult. Um, and I, I think some of us, we've, there was the adrenaline of just kind of shifting on the, you know, so much as a church and ministry and towards really wanting to serve tangible needs. And uh, like many of you, probably around the country, I mean, so, much, so many people are grieving. And, and here it was kind of the same. There was this adrenaline rush. And then I think the, the longstanding kind of like, wow, we are in this for the long haul, the uh, economic devastation, and it's very real. And so there's been a lot of lament and weeping. And I think we're trying our best to just figure out how to do this, you know? And I think like so many of you around the country, um, but it has been hard. And in some ways, there's, it's almost been a tale of two cities as, as well. There's been kind of the outer boroughs have been hit way harder. Uh, immigrant communities, blue collar workers, like it's just, it's been really, really hard. And, uh, and then meanwhile, a, a lot of the churches that uh, and pastors that I've talked to from Manhattan, uh, Center City, a lot of them, you know, a lot of the congregations have just kind of left the city because they have the means and the ability to do that. So it's been, it's been this fascinating kind of the disparities of the city are coming to light. Um, but I think I've come into this place of just really like, wow, we, we really need to brace ourselves for the long run now, do our best to serve the immediate needs as we can. So raising money, um, volunteering wherever we can with safe distancing and um, but I think I think my most recent kind of rumination is how do how can we sustain a life-giving kind of ministry for the long run uh, a pastoral coach who's just been checking in regularly he's like man all the pastors I know were you know are giving into a lot of their temptations and addictions and uh and he was just like, Drew, how are you doing? And I'm like, man, I'm tempted too. I mean, but, yeah. and, and, but I think it's brought out in some ways the best and the worst. And so I think now I'm in a season of like, wow, what, what, what's really healthy for my inner life for the long run here? So, um, yeah. Real quick, before we move into some of the other questions about health, you shared, uh, you know, you shared, I, I read just recently, I think it was an email you sent. I've gotten to be a part of, of Drew's prayer team. I get his prayer letter and pray for them constantly. But you shared, I think it was in one of your prayer letters about a drive you did, or like you were walking through the streets of Manhattan, it was empty. What was that? Yeah. Oh, it was, I think it really hit me when I went into Manhattan on a Monday at noon, which normally it's bustling. And obviously, Brad, and you and I, we both love the city and like, and just to be walking through the streets and seeing so many I mean, it was a ghost town and it was noon on a Monday uh, and restaurants were closed and shuttered and boarded up. And it just, I just was grieving and lamenting as I was walking through just, um, and I was walking to a friend's restaurant who had opened a restaurant and their restaurant was serving food towards fr frontline workers. And we were trying to support them as a local small business. And I just walked out of the restaurant with gloves on and with my mask. And then I just broke down and wept on the streets. There was no one around. And it was, it was just this very eerie kind of feeling. I never thought we would be in this situation and, and here we are. And so, um, yeah, and that was, that was about a month ago. And so it's been just kind of this ongoing grieving, lamenting also. Um, yeah. And then trying to figure out how can we really be and embody the love of Jesus in this time with all wisdom and generosity and courage that we can. So, you know, when you talk about um, that moment where, you know, you, you break down. I think there's a lot of us, I think all of us, I think we can just say all of us, there's sort of a, 
Um, there's a there's a grief that we're carrying. There's a sorrow. There's a heaviness I think that we're carrying, mm -hmm. and and that I think kind of helps us talk a little bit and kind of lean into the conversation around emotional health. Um, th for those of you that maybe you, you read the bio, Drew is actually really um, really connected to Pete Scazzaro and the that really a partner. You're a partner of theirs in the emotional healthy leader, emotionally healthy ministry. And, you, and you've been an advocate for that for a long time. And I think um, for those that haven't maybe read the books or d jumped into that, can you describe for us, before we talk a little bit about what it looks like in this season, when you talk mm -hmm. about emotional health, which is huge to you, what does that define for you? How would you frame that? Yeah. Um, well, I know that the image that's often used in emotionally healthy spirituality and is the image of an iceberg, that there's an iceberg, 90%, of course, is below the surface and 10% is above the surface. And emotionally healthy spirituality is really wrestling with what are those things below the surface that no one sees. So, of course, uh, they're in ministry, especially, and especially in kind of any kind of public life, there's the public projection versus what's happening in the inner world. And so for me, and I was on staff with Pete for 10 years. And so really, as Pete was working this out, and as we were working out as a church, um, my whole journey was delving deep into that 90%. And it was a very eye opening experience. And so for me, um, emotional health is really diving into all the stuff below the surface what's happening in my emotional world, what's happening uh, in my soul, uh, how am I, am I running at a pace where I am simply, and I realized even in this pandemic, uh, my initial impulse was so action oriented that I wasn't aware of the, the latent grief that I was carrying. And so things like that has been really kind of important. And, and then I think a word, if I were to encapsulate the word that stands out to me when it comes to emotionally healthy spirituality, I'd say it's the word, uh, uh, integrity, I think, is, you know, and it, like the word integer kind of, you know, the word integrity really comes from this idea of wholeness, like a whole number, integers, like a whole number. And how is whatever's happening internally, how does that match what my external public life looks like as well? And so finding integrity within my family, within my marriage, within my ministry, all of those things uh, are things that have become deeply important to me. Now, of course, what that means then is I'm just open about my crap, you know, <laughs> the fact that uh, <laughs> the fact that it, it is a difficult journey and that um, oftentimes finding congruence in my public and personal life uh, is a difficult journey, but as much as possible, I want that to be one where I'm living out of integrity. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, you know, there, so there's emotional, healthy spirituality, and then there's most emotional, healthy leadership. Mm -hmm. What are some of the unique challenges that that you, outside of any circumstances that we're in right now, what are some of the unique challenges of leadership and emotional health? Yeah, I think, um, well, so I, I think the two things that often come to intention often is this idea of missional leadership and then emotional healthy leadership. And oftentimes, for instance, a lot of the people who tell the stories of, hey, be healthy, practice Sabbath keeping, and uh, don't, and they're usually saying it from a, don't do what I did when I crazily went about planning this church and was totally, you know, missional and spending, you know, nights out every night of the week. And so, and, and then I went through this phase of burnout and then I've come to the other side. And so a lot of times I think the stories that we hear are folks who have um, been crushed in that journey of missional leadership that ends up coming to realize, hey, I did it wrong. Don't do it that way. And so I think for a lot of church planners, there's this question of like, well, how do, how do I do this when my to-do list is a gazillion types, you know, uh, you know, this checklist is unending. And so really kind of the things that I've been pondering is what does missional leadership look like? Um, and, and doing it in an emotionally healthy way. So for instance, emotionally healthy spirituality, one of the principles that we talk about is uh, embracing the gift of limits. But then part of the missional charge of church planning is like, hey, there are no limits. God can do anything. He can raise the dead. And if right. he can do that, he can raise the bread or whatever, you know, like, so coming to grips with, it seems like they are paradoxical, but really I think they're to live together in tension of how do I do th something at a sustainable spirit-led pace 
Um, but at the same time, lean into risk taking and into kind of missional imagination and leadership. And so I think um, emotional health, I, I think that what ends up happening often is I think folks who tend to push heavily on the emotional health end, um, which tend to probably be more, I'd say, shepherd, teacher types, I'd yeah. say probably need more of the missional edge. And I think folks who tend to lean towards the missional edge, like advancement, which a lot of church planters, the reason why we plant church is because of mission and engagement, probably need to really heavily lean towards the emotional health end, where uh, for emotional healthy leadership, we talk about four different things. Um, facing your own shadow, um, going back to go forward, um, being before doing, um, and... I forget the fourth one, sorry. But, uh, <laughs> but it's basically that principle of like, that I'm wrestling with kind of my inner life and I'm doing things at a pace that are sustainable and God honoring for the long run. Would you talk about those things just a little bit, each one of those a little bit more, maybe what that looks like for you in your, just every, your, your daily life as a leader, as a church planter, what does that look like? Yeah, so for me, so those four things, like um, facing my own shadow. So regularly doing check-ins um number one with my wife um so for instance pete and jerry scazzaro there came a moment where i remember talking to jerry about this and jerry's his wife geraldine and she was she was saying she said she refuses to to meet with pastors anymore without their spouses mm. because she said if <laughs> if she, the person's not going to be with their spouse then they're probably not going to be telling the truth and uh and so i in many ways like the the home and, and my marriage is, um, is probably the biggest indicator of like what's real and true and what's authentic. And so, um, so I think getting regular check-ins with my wife and I, um, counseling for me, spiritual direction. Um, I regularly lead the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality course in our church. And it was interesting because Pete asked me, he said, Drew, why don't you find one of your staff people to run this discipleship course? And I said, Pete, you don't understand. I said, I need to continually be seeped in the material of going beneath the surface. This isn't necessarily for me to lead others as much. It's also for me that I need to continually be reevaluating what's happening below the surface. And so that's why I personally choose to lead the course time and time again. And so for me, so for instance, so facing my own shadow, and that is regularly taking an inventory even with our staff team about some of the blind spots that I have as a leader, regularly doing check-ins again with people that I love and that are close to me and hearing from them, uh, getting feedback loops from our staff. You know, I think those are all very important. And of course, doing, just doing the intentional work. Um, I think there came a moment, I realized the moments when I feel like I've arrived, and this even happened when I was on staff at New Life, like I remember just thinking like, oh yeah, I've, I've kind of mastered this emotional health thing you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then of course I got burnt out, was working too many hours, no one's fault, but my own. And I just realized, Oh man, I really need to reevaluate like what, where my rhythms went, you know? And so, so I think those regular check-ins to figure out what my shadow is. Um, uh, yeah. One of the principles was also leading out of one singleness or marriage. And so out of my marriage, I think, um, how can I have just a thriving marriage that really honors God and where my wife and I, it's not only that we're being faithful to one another, but we're being passionately in love with one another. Oh, yeah. and, and I think there's a difference between those, right? Like, mm -hmm. and I think too many times, I think, um, I know that in my Christian paradigm and in the family of origin that I grew up with, it was basically being faithful and tolerating one another. Like that was the goal of marriage. And right. I think, um, but what does it look like for me to invest in my marriage in such a way where it becomes my highest priority outside of my relationship with God? And so um, in premarital, we say to couples, you know, so many marriages, so many couples, they spend so much on the wedding day, mm -hmm. but they don't spend nearly as much financially, emotionally on staying married. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's amazing that we can do that. Like we spend thousands of dollars, but like when it's like, Hey, I think you should really invest in a counselor. It's like, I don't know. The cost seems too high. Right. But like when it comes down to the, to the long standing kind of um, 
yeah, journey of marriage and family. And so um, uh, the third principle going back to go forward is, so for me, it's, and that relates to counseling as well. And I'm constantly reevaluating um, family of origin stuff. So even this past summer, I was on sabbatical and uh, on sabbatical, I started to see a trauma therapist um, because my wife had a, an emergency surgery last January that just kind of rocked us and rocked me um, and our family. And the way I responded to it was pretty emotional in the moment. And then afterwards, it was just like, get to work. And so I became a workhorse. And, uh, and as I was pondering that, I realized, like, I, you know, and, and actually, I was talking to some mentors, and they're like, you know, you should really, the way that you dealt with that very traumatic event in your life was not, it just seemed like you went straight to work. And so I, I had to go to a trauma therapist to wrestle with what were, where did that come from? And I realized it came, I mean, war-torn generations, like the Korean American journey for an immigrant. And it was always, yeah, we just go to work. You know, you could be in war. You just go to work. That's what you do. And, uh, and I realized I needed to, to really kind of delve deep into that and how my family of origin affected that. Um, and even in my parenting and things like that. And um, yeah. And then, um, yeah, let's see, someone just wrote in the text box. And then the last thing is slowing down for loving union. Um, so that's the being before doing. Yeah. And uh, for me, that's, uh, I am such a doer. I am a, I'm a two on the Enneagram helper with a three wing. And so I just automatically say yes to things and I want to do stuff all, you know, and I, I I'm a helper by nature. Um, and I'm super, like I mentioned, my family of origin, we are workaholics. And so being before doing is so difficult for me. And so like practices such as Sabbath keeping, um, even going on sabbaticals. So when we first started our church, we actually put in place a sabbatical like package for pastors as a church planter we're talking to our leadership and saying i think we should give our pastors a three-month sabbatical every three years and i remember like they were just like oh that sounds interesting like why and i just and i just told them i said because i'm a workaholic and if i'm not forced to stop and to to ponder then I will run myself into the ground. And there's been some seasons of depression and burnout because of that, because of my family of origin issues. And so since we started the church in 2012, so we've had two, three month sabbaticals uh, in 2016, as well as in 2019, just as a way of slowing down. And of course, that's in addition to, um, you know, uh, regularly practicing Sabbath keeping and things like that. Wow. So, yeah. So those are some of the things when it comes to those four. Well, one of the questions, man, one of the questions I want to get to is how about during this crisis and mm -hmm. what's it look like for you right now? How are you staying? Is there any particular category that you're focusing on during this? You guys are essentially locked down in your apartment. Yeah, it's been, um, I mean, we're, I'm focusing on it all trauma. Um, our family is in a situation right now where we're irritable with one another. Um, it's been, you know, so my wife and I have had to have several clarifying conversations. Not around those clarifying conversations. <laughs> <laughs> you know, ex expectations around everything, you know, around oh, who's homeschooling. When does one person go out? When does one person come back? When does, you know, like, and it's been exhausting. And, trying to serve the needs of the church. And I think there was this belief that, oh yeah, if I'm at home, I'm not going to, you know, all that travel time now is going to be gone. And as a result, my capacity is going to be higher. What I found is I've just been more exhausted. And actually it was Pete who, I, I, it, when this pandemic hit, I was, you know, most of the, the Christian stuff that I was reading was stuff that totally captivated me. It was, hey, this is our moment to be on mission and to love our neighbors. And so I just threw myself into that. And then I listened to one of Pete Scazzaro's podcasts and uh, it was funny. He was one of the few people who was saying, um, in this season, I think our capacity needs to be 50% less 
rather than more <laughs> and that we really need to 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 slow down and uh it was it was just a fascinating moment i think it was a prophetic kind of invitation for me personally and so but it's been hard i mean we've we've gosh we just had an argument today i mean we're we're <laughs> we're trying to figure it out and trying to figure out how to how to manage life and how to grieve um one person i you know it's it's not like how do we flourish working from home it's um hey we are in the midst of a global pandemic let's just let's just say that first remind right. ourselves of, of that moment and let's just grieve that reality and then in light of that you know everything else we're trying to get done we realize it's it's so we've lowered our expectations greatly <laughs> related to that um and so yeah doing as much as possible to try to check in try to create rhythms in our life so we do have sabbath keeping we actually created a rule of life which is an exercise in crafting kind of a life plan an intentional conscious plan to make jesus the center we created a special one for our church for for just this moment for the COVID 19 crisis and like as a church how are we going to try to make jesus the center of everything um how are we going to try to continue to practice Sabbath keeping? How are we going to try to continue to live missionally, but do it at a pace that can be sustained for the long run? So it's really good. My, my wheels are just turning. They're spinning right now on so many different things. And uh, I've noticed, I've noticed just that stuff changing for me. There's little things, there's big things. It's interesting. You talked about the expectations and just, I love that you just said, start with, Hey, we're in a global pandemic. Now what? And I, <clears throat> I did an interview this week for our church with a, a licensed therapist, family therapist that's uh, part of our, our congregation. And one of the things that she talked about was just reducing expectations. You know, one of the questions to ask, like, what am I letting go of? And I realized I was really okay with letting go of some of the normal regularity stuff of life, the rhythms, that's all fine. Um, but then what I suddenly realized was the expectations that I put on myself to perform at a certain level during this season and to be doing something and to have, you know, tangible ways to measure my success or actually really to validate who I am. Uh, there's my family of origin stuff. I don't want to feel good and get accolades. So, you know, just the need to let that stuff go. It's just so essential. So I just love that you're, that, that we do that knowing this. That's awesome. Yeah. We're going to shift gears uh, and you guys are going to about to discover like Drew is a guy that we could talk about emotional health a lot. The reason he's on here, and, and I will say this, if you haven't checked out emotional healthy leadership or emotional healthy spirituality, please do. Um, it's really, really good. And I can just say as somebody who's walked along side of life with Drew for the last seven years, um, I've watched you journey in this and you, you're honest about the ups and downs, but you are a really healthy person, at least in my life. And so it's awesome just to see it play itself out over several years in someone's life. Um, that's, that's really what I've seen. But I want to I wanna move and talk about church planting. There's a ton of church planters on here. Yeah. And um, you planted Hope Church in 2012. Tell us the story. Just let everybody hear kind of the story of what happened and where it is today. Yeah. So in 2012, well, so I was on staff at New Life for 10 years went through a desert season, ended up resigning from that, didn't know what was next, um, was very close to accepting a call at a larger church in California where I originally grew up and felt God speak to us to go and start what would become a family of churches. Um, and so in 2012, in Astoria, Queens, we started uh, our first church and it was called Hope Astoria, and it was with this vision to start what would become a family of diverse churches here in New York. And so since 2012, um, we've started, yeah, nine Hope churches. And um, yeah, and in that process, it's been quite a ride. We have, I, I love what we're doing. I love uh, the folks that we're rolling with, um, actually, and with the Foursquare as well, two of the churches right now are Foursquare churches, and we'd love to help plant more. And, you know, those two, the two Foursquare pastors, David Jung and Russell Joyce, are some of the most dynamic young leaders. And I, I love those guys to death. Um, I call Russell Luka Doncic uh, for any basketball fans. He's like this young prodigy basketball player. Um, but anyhow, he's a, uh, but he, yeah, and, and, yeah, and so we've started those nine churches. I currently lead our Midtown Church, uh, which 
was the fourth church that started. Um, so I lead that one as well as there's a church that we just, that just merged within our family um, in Chelsea called Hope Chelsea. So I'm currently leading that with the intention of um, um, hopefully one day finding someone to replace me in that congregation. And uh, one church that we did start has left our family of churches to start another um, uh, family of churches. And then we've also started a network called the New City Network, which is um, basically a network of urban churches that center around five values, urban, multi-ethnic, spirit, emotional health, and mission. And so, yeah, so that's been our journey right now. And I'm, so I'm currently the lead pastor of Hope Midtown as well as Hope Chelsea. And then I'm kind of like, uh, I don't know, the point person for our family of churches, the Hope Church, NYC family of churches. And then I am kind of the founder, co-founder of the New City Network with Edwin Cologne. So that's, that's, those are the three buckets I, I would say that I kind of do. And yeah. Oh, there's so much here to talk about. Um, so first of all, just to rewind a minute. So everybody heard this, you guys planted the first one in 2012 and here we are eight years later and there's nine churches that have been planted. So that's, um, that's a little better than one per year. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so, so we talk about Sabbath and we talk about pace. We obviously know um, Drew's not just sitting around reading books on, you know, <laughs> yeah. not, not doing anything. You're planting nine, nine churches. And I love just so everybody is aware. I mean, one of the cool things about Drew is um, incubating, like, you know, just saying, Hey, we're going to plant churches. And some of those are going to be evangelical covenant churches, which is what the other ones are, or some of them are four square churches. And the openness that you guys have had of saying, no, we're just, we're here to plant churches and we're going to partner. So the hope network is, has churches from different denominations in it. Um, you had this vision for a family of churches. One of the reasons why I think it's such a valuable, uh, first of all, there are size dynamics that you're dealing with. Yep. yep. Um, you guys have constraints on size and space. Um, I think one of the reasons why you, this conversation is so valuable for so many on the call is that you never dreamt of planting a mega church. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about that vision for planting a family of churches. What did that look like? What are some of the dynamics of how that, how those churches function, like, like their size, kind of what your vision was behind that? Yeah. Well, I think part of it has to do with New York. And so and part of that has to also do with our, my unique charism. And so, and so even the way that we're set up, so our Hope family of churches, we're actually, each church is legally and financially independent. And if one of the Hope churches wanted to become like more of a mega church, so for instance, like Russell Joyce is an extraordinary preacher. I could easily see their church becoming like a mega thing. And uh, so we, we talk about it in terms of charism, but I, I, in terms of my own journey of why we elected to go in this direction, a lot of it has to do with New York. Um, so, and part of New York, you know, most of the training when it comes to church planning has to do with building kind of an attractional, an attractive service. Yeah. And usually that takes an incredible, you know, preacher, musical experience and kids ministry and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, and most of the churches are kind of geared towards that. And even the launch strategies are geared towards that. But the thing in New York is that we're competing against Broadway, you know, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the best brunch places in the world. <laughs> and so, and then not only that, but if one can even think about if we're competing against that, and then we're competing against like, there's this church called Hillsong, that has arguably the, the best musical worship environment in the world. And then there's this you know, guy named Tim Keller, who arguably is one of the best preachers in the world, who honestly, if I had an unchurched friend, I'm like, hey, don't listen to me, listen to this Tim Keller talk, you know? And, and so in many ways, like, I think what happens to church planning in New York then, it becomes this, this weird, like, as churches are thinking about planting in a place that's post-Christian and that has so many attractive other possibilities, um, and yet all the training is geared towards, hey, preach sermons like Tim and have a worship experience like Hillsong, but we don't have the resources for that. Then I'd be, I think church planners are often left with this moment of like, this crisis moment of like, what in the world am I supposed to do? Yeah. And actually, I think you, uh, Brad, and some of the stuff that you've taught about missional engagement, I love it because um, when it really caused us to ask the question like, hey, we are never going to out Hillsong Hillsong. Yeah. And I will never out preach Tim. And so what do we do then to, to what, what is going to be our unique contribution as church planners here in the city? And so for us, we said very early on that our, 
that we would frame it around mission and incarnation and presence. And so the word presence for us, it was how do we cultivate communities where there's this authentic presence filled worship experience that doesn't need the bells and whistles, but there's an earnest, authentic presence filled kind of worship experience. And so that was number one. Number two was presence with like a community that deeply loves one another. Like how can we be super duper just present with another and grow the kind of sticky community where in a place like New York, where it's so individualistic, where people just love to be together. And then lastly was a presence in the neighborhood. Like how do we have a presence with people, um, especially the unchurched and how can we be if we can do those three things and what what we realized about those three things is those things did not require a massive budget <laughs> those right. things did not require like bells and whistles great facility and all this stuff which is already hard to find in new york and so we said if we can lean into that now that doesn't mean that we don't care about having quality worship and all that stuff it just meant we really want to lean into um you know a lot of the stuff that you've taught us about missional engagement and so we said if we can do that be present um and then what would it look like then if our church could grow to a certain size that we would just kind of spin off new churches in different neighborhoods and so our churches are not terribly large you know as you know brad like our churches range from anywhere on a sunday service from like 75 to i'd say 300 maybe you know and so each of the churches but together collectively we we're part of a bigger whole, but our churches um, are really this collection. And so our church, when we reached our, the first church that we started, when we reached about 200 people on Easter Sunday. So that was like our max attendance. Yeah. We said, I think we've got enough to maybe send 20, 20 to 30 to a new neighborhood to start a new church. And so that's kind of what we've done is that we would send a group of people to start a new church. And so it's not like we were like this terribly, like we need to get to this certain size. It was, how do we do sustainable mission at a certain size? And then how do we continue to send people um, in this way that they can also practice presence filled ministry wherever they go, you know? And so, um, so I think that's been our approach to how we've done things. Um, and some of it's been, uh, some of it's worked, some of it hasn't, but um we it's been it's been a lot of fun though and it's been and i love again i love the people that we're rolling with and that we've um, been able to journey together with so um now each of the churches we all each church carries the same theological core and the cultural core so even though they might be from different denominations we still have the same theological core and cultural core and and deep abiding friendship and because one of the early decisions that we made was are we going to be multi-site and centralized and or and we said no we really believe in context and this is nothing against multi-site and i wasn't the type of leader i'm again i'm a two on the enneagram so i'm not like a very directive like this is where we're going i'm much more of like hey how do we get behind you and your vision yeah and so that's what we did we just got behind people who had certain visions and so our culture is actually a one of the words, the word, the one word that we've used to describe our culture is an empowering culture. Mm -hmm. We want to empower people to be on mission, however God has des designed them to be. And so, so that's kind of been how we've approached things in the manner that we have and why we have. And um, yeah, so I can't remember what the question was. Sorry, Brad. I, well, yeah. And there's so many other things. I, you know, just, I know a bunch of you that are on this call. Um, you've read Beholding and Proclaiming by Christian Hernandez. Uh, it's a book on preaching. And Christian actually pastors the first plant that you planted. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's kind of a crazy story because you guys, you, you planted that. Then he came in, joined you there. And then you guys launched how many, like that was a, that was a busy womb, if you will, for a little while. Yeah. Yeah. So Chris, yeah, Chris came on. And so, uh, and some of it um, also is this combination of the apex, the fivefold, you know, like figuring out, okay, whose gifts are best used in which area and so chris came on and he took over the church that we had originally started and that church has flourished long after tina and i left and handed off leadership to him and that first church helped start i think four other churches and uh and again the, it's not like the church was unusually large it was just that church that maxed out at that size kept spinning off people and sending people and then our church in midtown it's the same it's probably similar in size and scope to the original church in astoria and now we've just begun, you know, sending people and residencing people and sending them. So um, right now I, I love, again, like I love our, you know, we've got residents in the different churches and 
our churches are at sizes and capacities to go ahead and start new churches um, and to multiply them um, due to training and partnering with different denominations like the Foursquare as well as with City to City and others. So, um, yeah, so that's been our process. Yeah. And I, I love this, just, you know, this is kind of cool that like, so you guys planted a bunch out of, out of Queens and then you were like, no, no I'm supposed to go do one. And so you yeah. went, well, I mean, you did one in Roosevelt Island, then you went and did one in Midtown. I, I yeah. just love that, that um, I think, you know, sometimes we have this model of, you know, somebody going and planting in, I mean, truly as a two on the Enneagram, um, but you still have this apostolic gifting to watch you as a leader go, you know what, I, I planted this, but I'm going to move on and go do this now. And just to kind of see you apostolically moving around the city is a, has been a really cool thing to watch. Um, somebody asked this question. They said, is there a maximum attendance you shoot for when it comes to starting a new family church out of a congregation? Yeah, I mean, for me personally, and again, our different churches, it's up to them because their own local leadership might have a different decision. For me, it was always uh, around 200. Um, and when I say 200, I'm saying 200 who are, you know, active participants within the church. Yeah. Um, so, for, so, and then I, I thought that we would have them, once we hit 200, we have the margin then to be able to send people and resources to start these new churches in different areas. Now, sometimes our church planning has taken different shapes and forms. So for instance, we started a church in the morning, we went to two services, we reached 200. Now keep in mind, our spaces only fit 100. So yeah. like, say we reached 200 and then we would look at a different neighborhood or have someone in our pipeline and we basically say, Hey, you've been leading these groups of 20 to 30. Why don't you just start something in the evenings in a different part of town? And so some of it, again, the limits of space and where we are in New York have um, accelerated some of this like movemental energy. Yeah. And so um, I have certainly been kind of on the forefront of helping start new churches and then handing them off. But um, really the collective, I mean, each church has done a marvelous job of just each lead pastor as well as their teams of really missional engagement. Like Russ, who's a four square pastor. I mean, he, <laughs> we very, we resource him mostly with friendship and love and uh, some meals here and there. But he, I mean, he has such a pioneering missional spirit and they have created just a tremendous faith community in Brooklyn. And so, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. That's so good. Um, I, I love, you know, one of the things I, th I think it's so good for us all to hear too is like, yeah, I mean, we get to 200 at the time to plant. And I think a lot of churches are thinking, no, I need like a thousand people to plant a church. And uh, man, I just, it's such a healthy thing to hear. And I think those are constraints for the city, but I think it's also inspirational for the rest of us that it's like, no, no, there's a way to raise up residents. I mean, you're, you, you have residents and you have church planters that are going out in a congregation size, it's actually more like the norm in America, not the abnorm. And so I think that's a really beautiful thing, just kind of shows how, how multiplication happens. Um, so the, the family of churches, I, I could get into some questions around that, but I want to dive in. Actually, I want to move in um, to the New City Network for a minute. Yeah. Um, so you and Edwin Cologne, those of you that have ever heard of Recovery House of Worship, um, Edwin Cologne is the pastor of, of Recovery House of Worship in Brooklyn. Um, if you were to put two people on a spectrum, of like them landing in the same friendship group, Drew and Edwin are like, how in the world did you guys ever meet? Um, Cause Edwin's story is crazy. Um, and just kind of where he came from and then where he is today is just unbelievable. But you guys started this network. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about there's core values. I'd love to hear kind of the rationale behind those specific values and then what that, the hope of that network is. Yeah. So Edwin and I, um, there were a few things that were happening. One was he and I really wanted to work together and someone had mentioned the possibility of merging churches. And so we were exploring that, but it became so clear that, um, like you said, Brad, like their, Edwin and their church has such a unique, beautiful charism that it didn't, it made sense that they would stay kind of who they were, but we still had a deep friendship. And then meanwhile, um, New Life Fellowship, the church that I came from, we were looking for ways to also be working together in planting churches. And so um, out of that, we were um, just wrestling with what, what, what are the values that we feel fit us as well as that fit kind of um, maybe this, the cultural moment that we find ourselves in. And so for us, it was urban 
because we were, you know, committed, deeply committed to urban ministry. Um, secondly, it was multi-ethnic. Um, it was actually really important to us that the church planters that we were um, drawn to were people of color and that we were resourcing were people of color just to show that, hey, you know, that church planning is not simply uh, a white male thing, but really something where people of color could come and lead these dynamic churches in urban settings. Um, and spirit-filled, so something that's fueled by the spirit, like a, like a real conscious radical dependence on the spirit. Yeah. And then emotional health, again, that um, is really, you know, of course, Recovery House of Worship, they embrace the 12 steps, um, and as do I and, you know, their Christian principles, but really emotional health that really undergirds everything. So how do we have spirit filled emotional health and lastly mission. And so those five values were what really marked those initial three churches. And so it was out of that, that we said, Hey, you know what, let's, what if we were to coalesce just these gatherings around these values? And so what ended up happening was we just invited our friends throughout the city. Hey, why don't you come and join us? And so we hosted these gatherings and uh, that group that began with about 10 to 12 pastors who would gather here in the city, it just continued to expand and expand. And uh, now we have three lunches. Well, you know, this is pre pandemic, of course, that would happen where we had invites both in Queens, Brooklyn, and in Manhattan. And, and then we hosted a gathering, the new city gathering, which you came out and spoke at uh, a couple of times. Spoken white, spoken white guy at the new city. <laughs> I mean, it was great. We love, yeah. and obviously, yeah, you're basically Korean. So, um, <laughs> no, so we ended up, yeah, we had a, um, and we, it would just basically, be, it just became a network of, a relational network of friends who valued the same things. And slowly it's continued to expand. And so we ended up, uh, the new city network, we helped seed fund maybe 25 different churches across the country again around these values and now we're trying to build it into a bit more of a robust network because we were basically giving out these grants but we weren't asking for anything back and we weren't creating and so it still is in that phase where it's mostly a convening thing so for instance even during this pandemic we've just been convening every week maybe 100 to 150 pastors and leaders from New York City just to connect with one another as we're kind of in the midst of this crisis. And so, um, so it's been, so that's been, and so Edwin and I, again, because we align around these five values as well as new life. And so now we're trying to dream together. Okay. What does this mean for us? Um, so for us, it was, it was not necessarily because I think so many church plan networks can become so, uh, um, Again, and not to say this is bad, but so mission driven and goal driven that we're going to plant a thousand churches by, you know, um, sorry if that's what Foursquare Multiply said. Oh. I don't know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, but for us, it was we're basically 12 good churches. That's, my, just <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good ones. that's it. Yeah, yeah. No. And for us, that's the, our goal is basically, man, if we can plant um, healthy churches that, um, that embrace these five values then if we can focus on that, yeah. then we think that God will do something. He will honor that and it will grow and expand beyond. And so that's been our, um, that's, yeah, that's been our approach when it comes to the, the New City Network. So right now, Edwin and I are trying to formalize what does it mean to be a New City Network church and all that stuff. Um, but essentially it's been coalescing around the five values and then creating um, training opportunities around these five values and things like that. Yeah. It's, and by the way, being a part of it, like going and, and just being at, at one of the conferences, it's such a cool, unique experience. And it's interesting because there's not very many organizations that, that share those, those types of values. I think that's, what's really beautiful about it is, you know, from multi-ethnic to spirit to, you know, emotional health, all of those things in one package. It's like, that doesn't happen very often these days. It just kind of seems like there's things that happen in maybe one or two of those different areas. Somebody asked a really great question and it's, it's this, and I think this is a great question for you to answer. In fact, yeah. Um, how did you capture the beauty of your ethnicity? And I'm assuming planted multicultural churches. So how did you capture the beauty of your ethnicity? Yeah. Um, well, it's been interesting in my experience with multi-ethnic churches. Um, my experience has been there's been two types of multi-ethnic churches. One is one that is almost like we don't talk about race at all. In fact, it's like we're not going to talk about any political issues, nothing. It's just 
it, and they tend to be far more Pentecostal in nature because of the expressive worship experience and things like that. Right. Then there's, you know, another kind of um, way of approaching it that I've seen in multi-ethnic churches is a very intentional kind of um, lean into wokeness, you know, and uh, justice ministries and things like that. And the, the background that I came from, so just to give some context, the background that I came from probably lean more towards this highly intentional reading up on, you know, backgrounds of other people and um, ethnicities and histories and being very intentional when it comes to power, to population, to uh, purposeful narratives um, and practicing solidarity. Like there's very intentional ways that um, new life kind of, that was the the training that I received from New Life, yeah. and so part of that has been this um, journey for me in really embracing with solidarity um, people from various different backgrounds as well as my own ethnicity. I think part of the interesting journey for me was, um, and this sorry this might take a long time to explain, but I'll give the short version. Is that I had vowed um, I grew up in a setting where I was part of an immigrant church growing up immigrant Korean church in Los Angeles. And it had like three or four different massive church splits, like really awful church splits. And uh, my father out of that became a pastor. And my, my father was someone who was incredibly driven and abusive. And so in my family of origin, then I just coming out of that experiencing experience, I told myself, I don't know if I ever want to be a Christian. <laughs> and, uh, and when I did become a Christian, I remember saying, I don't know if I ever want to go back to a Korean church again. And so I was all in on multi-ethnic, but my all inness on multi-ethnic, of course, it was great to be woke and all this stuff and, but, or to act like I was woke, however, you know, and, and I just realized that I, um, I had grown to really despise my own heritage and my own yeah. kind of journey and my own family. Mm. And so there was a real journey for me, even in planting the initial church that we did in Astoria. I remember uh, meeting with different church planning coaches and they were like, oh, the church that you plant will likely be uh, Korean and Anglo. So, and predominantly Korean. So just, just be ready for that. And I remember like this surge of like, I will not plant a Korean American church, you know, and this surge of like, resentment and this chip on my shoulder began to grow and uh and i just felt like god was doing something in me as we were in the church planning process and the initial church that we did start in astoria was incredibly diverse and it was you know over 30 to 40 nationalities very diverse socioeconomically and uh and then our church family our family of churches was going through all this kind of change and when i finally was called to start our, our church in midtown manhattan our initial core team was 95% Korean American professionals, yeah. um, like a lot like me, you know, and uh, uh, professional, I don't know, but like I was, it was, and it was this moment of like, and I remember just saying like, oh my goodness, am I selling out now? Am I planting mostly a, a, like a predominantly Korean American church? And it was during that time where I felt like God was really dealing with both the chip on the shoulder to be multi-ethnic and whatever, and to be hyper woke or whatever it was. And then also the pain of my own Korean American identity and the Korean American church that I had grown to really resent. Mm -hmm. And I felt like God had led me in this journey of like, just embracing both my own personal identity and my own journey as growing up in a Korean American setting and beginning to love my culture again, as well as my own people again, while at the same time valuing the beautiful mosaic of, you know, multi-ethnicity that exists here in New York. And so I remember just coming to this place of freedom, of freely just coming into my own as like, you know what, I am a Korean American who loves Korean barbecue. Like, I just need to embrace that and like yeah. live into that. That's why you're Korean, Brad. And, uh, <laughs> and then, but at the same time, how do we lean into building and cultivating diverse congregations? Now I realize there again, and I've been in some context where multi-ethnicity became the goal more than Jesus was. 
Yeah. And so, and that was often hurtful to a lot of people in the congregation because it was almost hyper vigilant about, oh, we need to have the right mix of this and this and this. And, um, and again, I am, I, I want to be intentional about all those dynamics of power and platform and all those things. Um, but at the end of the day, I remember coming to a place of God, I want the church that I lead in Midtown with 95% Korean, like, yes, our goal, our value is diversity. And we are going to lean into, again, power, platform, population, purposeful narrative, practicing solidarity. We're going to lean into all of those things. But at the end of the day, we want it to ultimately be about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And if those things ever trump having this be a a spirit-filled, Jesus-saturated place, then I'd rather shut this thing down, you know? And so I'd rather we were following Jesus in unusual ways, unusual, you know, orthodox, unusual ways, but like in a radical manner and pursuing multi-ethnicity. And so while embracing my own identity. And so that's what's happened. Our church in Midtown, it's actually grown in its multi-ethnic makeup, but really it's, it's done so. And I would say, and I, and I believe our team would say we've done it in a way that hasn't had it be like a, a burden or a yoke that has, in fact, it's been something that's just been a natural evolution of our values of our value of diversity, our value of celebrating different cultures and things like that. So, sorry, that was a long way around oh, going, but that's it's actually really, really good. And, and I'm actually going to just do like a real shameless plug right now for just a minute, because in two weeks, um, we're going to have Sung Chan Ra on and, and I'm going to interview him. And so um, Sung Chan is going to just probably unpack a lot along this conversation so we're going to really dive into that and drew you're welcome to join us for that too i know you and soon chan are friends and yeah and i would love to have you on for that conversation too that'd be really great and uh and then and and just so you guys know next week i'm just going to say this now and then we'll go back to questions next week i'm going to have a guy on named toby hatfield who is the head of the innovation kitchen at nike and so we're going to talk about innovation during this time when we sort of need to so just so you guys got a heads up on stuff that's coming up but um, I want to I want to close. I, I, obviously, if there's questions, please send some questions in. I've got a few here, but I'd like to kind of move the conversation back as we wrap things up to emotional health, and maybe we could you could just give us some advice, Drew. Um, and I, I was just thinking of a couple of, a couple of categories for advice. Maybe the first one being um, how a couple of points on how you integrate emotional health with a team, because it's mm-hmm. one thing to lead yourself. It's another thing to say, okay, I want to integrate this into a culture of a church or a culture of a team or volunteers. Um, how, do you, how do you integrate it that way? What are some, tri- some tips? Yeah, well, I mean, it, I know this sounds like a circular way of talking about it, but I really think that it has to begin with myself before it gets into the team. Mm-hmm. Because if I'm not authentically living these principles, then it can never seep down into the culture of our church community. And so I want to be modeling first all these things. And when I'm modeling these things, um, hopefully then, you know, we codify in our culture with our discipleship pathways, emotionally healthy spirituality, the course, as well as the emotionally healthy relationships course. And so I, I think the biggest way for me then is to regularly be practicing Sabbath to regularly be going on sabbaticals, Mm -hmm. to regularly being open and honest about my own journey with my shadow side, me um, modeling saying, I'm sorry, I was wrong, me asking for feedback about how I can improve. Mm -hmm. And so I think so many of it stems from who I am and like how I approach things. And so I think that's one thing. And so obviously, so it's, I think it's the modeling and then the codifying into culture. That's where Emotional Healthy Spirituality course, the eight-week course, and Emotional Healthy Relationships is an eight-week course. Those have become part of our, that's just part of the language now. It's yeah. part of the language. It's part of the culture that we've birthed. And so, so those, those, that's what I would say. One of, one of the things that, um, sorry, I realize I'm going to take this conversation in a little bit of a different direction, but- oh, great. One of the things I actually believe that emotional health has become a multiplication strategy for us. And so 
Um, and again, remember how I said that oftentimes they're pitted against each other. Like we can't right. multiply if we're being emotionally healthy. But to give you an example, like the two sabbaticals that I went on, uh, both in 2019 as well as in 2016, 2016 was when Russ and Mike Park, who you know, Brad, they both took over for me in Midtown and they both ended up planting churches. Yeah. And then in 2019, Kathy Bruce, who's with me, she's gone on to now, she wants to now plant a church. Yeah. And one of the things that I realized is that every three years when our sabbatical is, I've approached it in such a manner. I need to, in the next three years, I need to set up our church in such a way as if I become expendable and uh, as if I were to die. Like that's what my sabbatical is. I'm dying in three years. Mm -hmm. I'm going to raise someone up or leave it in the hands of someone who could lead this after three years. So and good. So, and so every three years then I'm in this practice of letting, detaching myself from the church, becoming an expendable person, um, dying to my own self and my own ambition. And I'm doing so by now intentionally investing in someone who's going to take over for me in three years. And then what I've realized is though, when I come back, you know, those people are then ready to plant churches. They're ready to go and lead. And so, um, so I actually think that healthy rhythm, like if I live with a healthy manner in which I say I am not kind of the alpha dog who's going to be the indispensable person of this, if I lead in that manner, then I'm going to be intentionally investing in others. And for the goodness of my own soul and my marriage, I'm going to be practicing healthy rhythms. Yeah. And then we'll be in positions where we can now send people who have had that experience. And now my dream and hope for these people who have planted churches now is like, guys, uh, I want you also to be living for the long run, you know, to be in this so we can grow old together here in New York. And even if you don't stay in New York, that we've grown old together as ministry friends around the world where we can celebrate what God has done yeah. by continuing to multiply um, in a healthy way. So, so when you, when you, when you planted the other churches, um, you worked that three month, that three year rhythm into the other church plants as well. Well, so the other churches, so for instance, Christian does a different thing. He does Christian Hope Astoria. He does one extra month every year. And so different churches have, and so now, I mean, our, our family of churches are so young that many of them haven't even passed the three year mark yet. Right. So, but I'm, I'm constantly banging the drum, like guys go on sabbatical, like find your replacement, do what you need to do. Um, and let's live into a healthy rhythm. So Man, you know, what a, what a beautiful thing. I mean, I think just to think the idea that the healthiest thing you can do is see yourself as dispensable and work yourself out of a job, what a healthy perspective that is. And I know, I, you know, I took the sabbatical a couple of years ago. And uh, when I did, I came back and everybody had just risen to the challenge. Every, like we, they brought more money in the offering than we had before. We wow, grew yeah. over the summer, you know, all those things and leaders were ready to go. And it's, it's just such an interesting thing that when we do that, good stuff happens when we take care of ourselves. Go figure that somehow like, you know, resting and doing all the things God called us to do actually produces fruit, you know? It's, yeah. You know, yeah. Pete Cazero, he says sometimes, he goes, you know, honestly, people, your staff needs a sabbatical from you, you know, yeah. <laughs> which I yeah. found like, I was like, oh, that might be right. Yeah. Yeah, it's so true. So true. Well, Drew, thank you so much. It's two o'clock. I want to really, or two o'clock here. It's yeah. Uh, yeah, a little later there. Uh, want to be so respectful of your time, but thank you so much for taking time today and, and just being with us. Um, uh, you guys can check out other stuff Drew's done. You, you know, he's online. I think you've been exponential this year, speaking, doing workshops and doing different things. So you can find some of that stuff online, hear more about what Hope Church is doing. But thank you guys for joining us. And Drew, thank you so much. You're such a good friend and uh, really, really appreciate you taking the time. We'll kick some information out to the rest of you guys around what's happening with Toby this next week. Uh, he's going to be really fun. And then also um, uh, Soon Chan Ra coming up uh, in two weeks. So it's going to be really awesome. great. Love, Love you guys so much. Thanks so much. You're an amazing family of churches. So you guys are awesome. And we will see you all very soon. Thanks, Drew. Thanks, Brad.